Good afternoon, everybody. It's really great to see so many people here. I know there are still people showing up, so thanks for bearing with us. But we're going to get started now, so I wish a really warm welcome to Central Hall at the University of York. Super to see everybody. We've got a real mixture in the audience today. Lots of you had this timetabled as one of your lectures for the Business Planning and Sustainable Entrepreneurship module. You all know me as module leader, uh, so welcome to you. But I also know we've got lots of guests here today because we actually opened up this lecture to be a public lecture. Uh, so for those of you who don't know me, because you've come from other modules, other programmes, UG and PG, and perhaps also the wider community, really welcome. My name's Claire Sinclair and I'm a lecturer here at the School for Business and Society. Um, and a very warm welcome to those of you who are joining us on our live YouTube uh, live stream. I know we've got colleagues and students joining us from City College in Thessaloniki, so a big, big warm welcome to you. But we've also got uh, colleagues, interested stakeholders, entrepreneurs, uh, general public from our local community and, and wider networks globally joining us on YouTube. So for those of you who are online, uh, a big wave and thumbs up to you. You're all very welcome um, here to the University of York. So we've got a really exciting session, really interesting session. I'm looking forward to it personally. Thanks, no Claire. pressure, Bob. Yeah. Um, so I'd love to um, introduce you to Professor Bob Doherty, who's the Dean of the School for Business and Society, and he'll be talking to us about his own entrepreneurship and experiences that are relevant for my students to your own business plans, to your summative assessment in a very real and tangible way, but also interesting uh, and useful for all of us uh, who've chosen to attend. Um, before I hand over to Bob, I will just let you know that using the QR code on the slides, or indeed the link on the slides, um, you can access the Padlet, which will enable you to ask questions. Um, and what we'll do is, uh, Bob's kindly agreed that if there's particular topics that are throwing up lots of questions, I'll stop him at that point and, and interject and I'll ask the questions on your behalf. So do keep asking those questions onto the Padlet and I'll be keeping an eye on those to make sure that we get those asked for you. Um, and any questions that we haven't gotten to by the end of the session, we'll make sure that we leave five or ten minutes at the end because I, I want to make sure this is really relevant for you, the audience, so we'll get those questions answered. So I think in terms of housekeeping, that's everything that I needed to say. Uh, let's just give a round of applause to Bob. Thank you so much. So uh, uh, thanks, Claire, uh, for the introduction. And just thanks to everybody who's uh, made it uh, to the lecture today. I know some of you have had to leg it all the way from Eslington East. So pretty impressed uh, with, with the speed. Um, so, yeah, th um, I'm going to speak for about 40 minutes, then open it out to, uh, to questions. And it's really, really great to see, see all of you. Um, so, I'm going to really talk about the experience uh, that I had in my own entrepreneurship. Um, I haven't always been uh, an academic, so for five years of my life, Back in 1998 to 2003, I was involved in establishing a new fair trade chocolate startup. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. What were the lessons learnt? What were some of the things that we, did, that we did that worked? Some of the things that we didn't work? And I'm going to explain all, all that to you today. I actually had a dream when I was a child. I either wanted to be a professional footballer uh, or I wanted to work for a chocolate company. And I, so, I, so I guess uh, one, of those, uh, one of those dreams uh, came true. And uh, Divine Chocolate is no ordinary chocolate company. Let me say that. It's very much a sustainable uh, uh, chocolate company. For example, the shareholders, 45% of the shares, are actually owned by a farmers cooperative in Ghana called Cuyapacoco. So that is actually a leap of imagination. To, to, to imagine that small-scale cocoa farmers, part of a cooperative, could actually own a brand, a share in a brand, in the global north, in US, UK, and Scandinavian chocolate markets, is very much a leap of imagination. Now, the other, re the other reason why Divine is very unusual is that it was set up to solve a problem. You know, it wasn't set up to make money for, for um, you know, individual shareholders. It was actually set up to tackle 
key sustainable development goals within West Africa. If you look at West Africa and you look at Ghana, the third largest export from Ghana is actually cocoa uh, after gold and timber. And if you look at West Africa and you look at Cote d'Ivoire and you look at Ghana, if you add up their total cocoa production, it accounts for over 70% of global uh, cocoa production. So it's very, very important to the economy of these fast developing economies in uh, West Africa. Now, however, there are a number of problems associated with cocoa. And back in uh, 2000 and 2001, uh, BBC and also CNN did a number of exposés about the problems in the cocoa sector. And two key problems, one is child slavery, children being trafficked from neighbouring African states to get involved in growing cocoa. And the second big problem is gender inequality within the cocoa industry. And if you know your sustainable development goals, Ge sustainable Development Goal 5 is all about gender equality and decent work is Sustainable Development Goal 8. So we set up, I mean, this, the, the, the business plan for this new fair trade chocolate startup was actually part of my own MBA dissertation and I developed it with a number of friends and when we set up the company there were three and a half of us who established the company based on this business plan that was developed from our uh, master's program. But we set it up to solve these problems. We looked at what other fair trade companies had done, like Cafe Direct, who had really tackled the problems in the coffee market, and we were wanted to do the same in the cocoa market. So that's the kind of underpinning. And we developed this amazing brand. I brought some, uh, I've actually given some chocolates out already to, to the staff team, uh, who will be munching on those later, I'm sure. But, the, uh, but you can see here, we, we, we developed within a very short space of time, 48 different products. We, we developed a range of molded chocolate block uh, products, and we also developed a range of seasonal chocolate products for Easter, for Christmas, we also developed a chocolate count line, a snack bar, with comic relief as well, called Double. And some of you may remember that from um, uh, an education pack that we launched in schools uh, all, about, all about fair trade. So you can see, you know, it was, it was a sizable piece of new product development as well within the Divine brand. So, just to explain the startup, because I know you, as part of your assessment, have to develop a business plan for a sustainable uh, entrepreneurship startup. So, how do you do that? We'd calculated uh, very early on in the business plan development that to launch this brand, it primarily, well, initially in the UK chocolate market, we needed £400,000. Remember, this was back in 1998. We needed that £400,000 for employing some staff for renting an office in Clerkenwell Road in London, near the Barbican. We also needed it for the first production run of Divine Chocolate. And, and we also needed it for marketing and market research. So we calculated we needed £400,000. And we went to see several different banks uh, to try and get that loan from the banks. But can you imagine, you know, we, we were... If you can imagine the chocolate market at the time, it's, it's a very sizable market in the United Kingdom. It's four billion pounds sterling in terms of value, but it's highly competitive. You know, the, the, the competitors are multinational corporations, the very large resource-rich uh, rivals, and the market at the time was very mature. So it wasn't really growing significantly because of all the issues around health, uh, so on and so forth. Um, and so we really struggled, actually, to persuade a bank to give us the loan. Can you imagine these three and a half, you know, these, these young upstarts, these MBA graduates going to a bank, even though we'd had some, um, you know, business experience in corporates, we didn't really have any FMCG experience within the team. And so the banks were quite, you know, banks are often very risk averse. And so we really struggled to get a loan. And um, we actually persuaded NatWest Bank, the community banking arm of NatWest Bank, to give us a loan, give us £400,000. But we had to provide a loan guarantor mechanism. 
And that's something unusual. It's quite common now for government to provide a loan guarantor mechanism, particularly for a startup that's trying to solve a problem within a market. Now, we went actually in 1997, before we even launched the product, we went to see a government department called DFID, Department for International Development, which actually doesn't exist anymore. And we, we, had, we had meetings with civil servants. We also had meetings with the Minister of International Development at the time, which was Claire Short. And you can imagine New Labour had just come to power in 1997. And they'd produced a white paper on international development, which had fair trade as a key component of that white paper. And so we actually persuaded government, believe it or not, to provide a loan guarantor mechanism for Divine Chocolate, and that released the loan from the National Westminster Bank. So that was very entrepreneurial. That was a real interesting piece of policy work, but also a very entrepreneurial to persuade government to support Divine Chocolate. On the provisor that we paid that loan back within three years, and they also did an impact assessment, monitoring evaluation exercise on Divine's impact in Ghana as well on these two sustainable development goals. So, in addition to that, you obviously have to also persuade a set of investors to get involved as well. And we were very lucky. Can you imagine, you know, Coco, fair trade startup, a loan guarantor mechanism from DFID. We also persuaded a series of really important investors who brought lots of resources to Divine Chocolate. For example, we persuaded the Body Shop to invest a significant amount of money in Divine, in Eater Roddick and Gordon Roddick at the time, bought their cocoa for their cocoa butter cosmetics, and cocoa is their third largest ingredient at the body shop, we persuaded them to also invest in Divine Chocolate. They paid the fair trade price for their cocoa, but they didn't make a big song and deal about it, and uh, we were very... We're very pleased to have them on the board because Gordon Roddick, Anita's husband, was a really good accountant and helped us a lot with our initial financing. Christian Aid and Comic Relief, two big charities in the United Kingdom, also invested and they provided, I'm going to tell you the story later, they provided the ability to mobilise consumers to go in and buy the product in supermarkets, but they also um, enable celebrities also to get involved. If you know anything about Comic Relief, which is a large charity in the UK which does these two big events, Red Nose Day and Sport Relief, they have access to an enormous number of celebrities, which we used a lot in the marketing of Divine Chocolate. Now, our mission uh, was very much very... I mean, if you look at Cadbury's... If you look at Mondelez's mission, or Cadbury's mission at the time, or if you look at Nestlé's mission, it's definitely not to improve the livelihoods of small-scale farmers in Ghana. Um, their missions are very different. It's about you know, shareholder growth, so on and so forth. So, you know, divine set up with a mission to improve livelihoods. That sustainable development goal eight, which is all about decent work. So moving on with the story, I just want to tell you a little bit about uh, Ghana, a little bit about Coco. We have some people listening online as well from the, uni from the Development Studies University in the north of Ghana that we've been doing some research with recently on a knowledge transfer partnership, and they're also listening as well. Uh, this is Coco. So I just want to transport you for a few minutes to West Africa and to Ghana. And it's a very unusu unusual crop because it grows on the trunk of the tree. And when cocoa is ripe, it's kind of yellow. These yellow pods, they're about the size of a rugby league uh, football when they're, when, they're, when they're ripe. And you knock them off with a stick. And if you, when you cut them open with a cut glass knife, you see this sticky, marshmallowy substance, which is actually cocoa. And if you, want to, if you taste it, it's quite sour at this particular stage. And then you ferment it between plantain leaves on the ground below the cocoa tree. And you ferment for about 10 to 14 days, and then you transport the cocoa back to the village, and you, uh, you dry on basket shelving in the village. And when you go to the villages in the evening in Ghana, this time of year, you can smell the aroma of cocoa. It's really intense in the, uh, in the atmosphere. And what's interesting about the, this cooperative, Cuiapacoco, when we set up Divine, it had 30,000 members. 
and now it's got 130,000 members as part of its cooperative. It's really grown uh, significantly across about 2,300 village societies all the way across Ghana. Uh, and its headquarters is in Kamasi in, in the central uh, belt of Ghana. A few definitions, a few academic def definitions for you, just to, just to make sure you, 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 know, you, you understand this kind of business type. Divine is very much a pioneer social enterprise. And social enterprises are businesses that trade, they commercially trade, but they trade for a social or environmental purpose. That's the difference. You know, they, they, they have still have to be as successful commercially as their private sector counterparts, but their mission is completely different. And as you can see that with the, with the mission of Divine Chocolate. And they're often referred to as hybrid organisations because they're not easy to categorise. They're neither private sector, they're neither charity, and they're neither public sector. They occupy the intersections of the three different uh, economic uh, sectors. And then fair trade. So Divine, like Cafe Direct, like Liberation Nuts, is a 100% fair, fair trade pioneer. So you know, it's a bit counterintuitive. Divine purposefully, and I, and, and I stress the word purposefully, pays more for its raw materials. It wants to pay more for its raw materials because it wants to improve the livelihoods of small scale farmers. So the fair trade cocoa price at the moment, the minimum price, is $2,400 a ton cocoa. So if the world market price drops below that, Divine will always pay $2,400 per ton. And the farmers like this because it gives them an opportunity to plan. They know their income year to year. And um, obviously it supports the improvement of livelihoods. As part of the fair trade contract uh, in COCO, companies have to also pay what's called a social premium, and that social premium for COCO is $240 per ton. And that's paid to the farmers' cooperative, Quiapa COCO, to their farmers' trust, and they then they decide democratically themselves. They vote in an annual general meeting, they vote in, um, in you know, their village societies, they vote to decide what to do with that money. So it's very much down to the producers, the farmers, to decide what to do with that. And then, and then Divine go that one step further. 2% of their turnover is then used for producer support and development. I'm going to show you some examples of what, how that money is used in, in a moment, but particularly used to develop community infrastructure, tackle those sustainable development goals, so on and so forth. Now, the other thing about Divine, which is back to the shareholding and back to the business model, is that they also get a dividend. They get a share of the profit. So if Divine makes profit, the farmers get a dividend. Now, what is the advantage of that? The advantage of that is that the cooperative is not only trading in the primary commodity. It's actually getting a share of where the value is and the value is very much in the final brand, you know, in the UK, US, and Scandinavian uh, markets. It's not in the raw material, the value is in the brand. So they even get further uh, income because of their shareholding. So this is Divine. And if, and if you look at Divine now on their website, you can see how, how much the brand has evolved. So this is what we launched with back in 1998. We actually had a big launch event in the Great Show Club in London. Uh, with lots of celebrities there. And we launched with this product, uh, Divine Milk Chocolate, Heavenly Milk Chocolate with a Heart. That was the brand strap line. We did lots of market research to get the name right, because you have to get the name right. Particularly if you want to develop an international brand, the name has to work in different cultural contexts. And so Divine was the perfect name for this kind of chocolate. And, um, but there were some issues with it, and you probably detected them already just by looking at it. Uh, remember, this was 1998, and we evolved the brand very, very quickly. 
and you can see and you can even if you go on the website now you can see how much it's evolved even further so my lesson to you is you've always got to if you set up your own startup you've always got to be evolving the brand now you can notice that the brand moved from landscape to portrait in its aesthetic design um, so it started off 150 gram landscape and then moved to 100 gram portrait now why did it do that it did that because supermarket space, in the, in the space on the shelf, the kind of uh, merchandising is very limited, it's, it's very competitive space. And if you look at confectionery, that space has never increased. It's always got smaller in the supermarket because, just because of the other product categories have developed and supermarkets have only got so much space. So having a product that's portrait uh, lends itself to having more products on the shelf and it's easier for buyers to make the move rather than having a product that's landscape. Also, a 150 gram bar, the packaging started to crease. If it went through, through, if it went through three or four different distribution points, uh, you know, different, different distribution points in the supply chain, it would start to crease in the, on the shelf. So it didn't look great. So we evolved the brand to this. And these symbols, that you can see on the brand today are called Andrinka symbols and they indicate the provenance of the brand. These Andrinka symbols are cultural symbols from Ghana. They mean bravery, they mean love, so on and so forth. They're cultural symbols. So again, it demonstrates the provenance of Divine as a, as a, as a product. And you can see now how, the, how the, the brand has evolved to lots of different flavors, you know, uh, and the other dimension, if you think back to 1998, and this is the importance of market research, milk chocolate was the norm, was the main um, taste profile, the most popular taste profile in the United Kingdom. But we knew from our market research, very early market research, that that was changing. And if you went to different other European states, you, you saw that dark chocolate, 70% plus, ingredient of cocoa, so very, very dark chocolate, was starting to grow. It was the only part of the market that was starting to grow. And so all our new product development from that moment onwards was in this space of dark premium chocolate. And what, you know what the beautiful thing of, about that is? Is that you're selling more cocoa. You know, if you think 70% cocoa, milk chocolate's only about 36 37% cocoa, that was Divine's milk. I mean, Cadbury's Dairy Milk's only about 28% cocoa. Um, so you, you, you immediately change the volume of purchasing you were procuring with the cooperative by moving the market toward, towards a dark chocolate uh, profile because of the high level of uh, cocoa content. So it's very much market manipulation, which we were very proud of, because it helped us deliver our mission as a, as a company. So this was the, these were the early days. So you might be, some of you, I know some of you weren't even born at this stage. <laughs> in, in, back in 1998, we had some very, very useful celebrities that supported Divine Chocolate. Uh, ben Elton, for example, who was a, was a comedian at the time, is now an author. Uh, just, he's just done that program about British Railways as well. And the thing about Ben was, he actually did 17 TV adverts for us on Channel 4, uh, UK television channel, and he did it for completely free. He didn't even want a penny for doing it. And that's just the type of guy he is. He's very, very big supporter of Divine. And Tony, Tony Robinson, who was a, you might recognise him, he was an actor in Blackadder and also did the Time Machine program. Another, again, another big celebrity uh, supporter of Divine. But the, the, in 1998, the UK market for fair trade products was only worth 16.7 million pounds. It's now worth over two billion pounds. And it just shows you what you can do if you want to change your market. And I'm gonna talk about some of the success factors in a, in a moment. We also did a very unique collaboration. It was one of the first ever uh, online campaigns. Um, this was in 2001. It was an online campaign with Christian Aid with their 200,000 supporters. And at the time, Tesco's would not stop Divine. Tesco's wouldn't, pro wouldn't put Divine on the shelf 
in, the, in that main, in that main <coughs> major supermarket. So we ran a campaign. We ran a campaign online and with a card that consumers could take into Tesco's and hand in at the customer service counter. And about 150,000 Christian Aid supporters mobilized and actually took that card in or, or made a message online to Tesco's. And I remember the buyer ringing me. I was in my car at the time. I had to pull in and take the call. And uh, he said, Bob, he said, you're, you're a real pain in the neck. He says, you know, you've, 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 you've created a real problem for me. I'm now going to have to stop Divine Chocolate. And they stopped it in every store. And that just shows you the power of cons consumers. If you can mobilize those consumers to sort of support your brand, it does make an impact on uh, major supermarkets. You might ask me, why wouldn't they stop the product? And I can answer that later if you, if you really want me to. Um, and this is another success story. So this is me only a few years ago. You, you, can, you can tell that, can't you? And uh, so this is, this is a picture in a major supermarket. We're in the headquarters of a major supermarket here. And the guy with the glasses is the head buyer of confectionery in a major supermarket. They've got 4,000 stores in the United Kingdom. And they've just decided, they've just decided to convert all their private label chocolate, molded block chocolate, to divine chocolate, to be procured from divine. And it's the co-op. It's their truly irresistible chocolate range is all made by Divine Chocolate now. It's about a three million pound contract. And I'm very proud to say I negotiated that deal and it made a big impact to the company and also made a big impact to the farmers. As you can imagine, you move, you, you're completely starting to scale up the company now through collaboration. Now the other person on the right here is Mr. Hohemi Tinye's he was the managing director of Quiapacoco at the time. And he came to England to talk to the co-op as part of the, uh, doing the deal. And what we're doing here is tasting all different ingredients of chocolate, which then ended up in their truly irresistible range of chocolate. The managing director of, of Divine Chocolate was at the time, for 16 years, uh, Sophie Tranchel, who's, who's on the end of the photograph uh, there, who's, who's a very good friend of, very good friend of mine. We also did some really interesting things with marketing communications. This was a, this was a campaign in Marie Claire magazine where we, where we featured uh, female uh, cocoa farmers. And take away the stigma that female cocoa farmers were, were, were you know, were, were um, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, were kind of older, they were hard done to, but this was diff very different. We wanted to create a positive image of female cocoa farmers uh, through the Divine brand, and we certainly did that. At the time, very few black females were featured in uh, TV advertising and, pr and print advertising, and we can kind of change that. We did a lot of things that were very radical uh, in Divine Chocolate. Um, and very importantly as well, is that the product was delicious. You can't have a sustainable product. You can't want to craft a sustainable brand without the product being delicious. It has to be high quality. And we certainly did that. If you taste Divine Chocolate, it is a superb, delicious um, uh, chocolate brand. Um, and I think some of you will get a chance to taste it uh, in, in, in a moment. But we did a lot of public relations. We did lots of events. We did lots of magazine features. Uh, we even had a, a Divine Cocktail in the Sanderson Hotel in London, for example, just to showcase the brand. Uh, every opportunity, we did loads of festivals, we did Glastonbury, uh, you know, we did all the big uh, major music festivals as well, and we had a big Divine uh, tent at, at those. We've got loads of public relations, lots, lots of unpaid for space. The great thing about doing public relations, because of the story, you get lots of unpaid for space in lots of different uh, titles, websites, uh, and these, this is just a selection of the kind of features that we were able to secure because of the powerful story of the brand. It was delicious, but also it, it was solving social problems in, in West Africa. What does success look like? 
I'll come to lots of social impact stuff in a minute. I'll talk about uh, clean water and I'll talk about uh, gender equality as well. But one of our biggest successes was the fact that some of our mainstream competitors also switched to fair trade. So Cadbury switched to fair trade, Kit Kat switched to fair trade. This is in 2006, 2007. And one of our objectives when we set up the company in my MBA business plan was to be a catalyst for change in the market, was to get other mainstream competitors to behave better, to actually procure and, and through their corporate social responsibility, actually behave better in the cocoa sector. And they did. And you can see that today. They've all got their own cocoa schemes. They're all doing really interesting things on living income, uh, so on and so forth. So we, we were really a catalyst for change in the cocoa sector was the divine chocolate. So when Cuyapa Cocoa set up in 1993, it set up before even divine set up. Uh, part of structural adjustment uh, in Ghana. Um, only about 22% of the membership were female, but by, by 2010, about 35% of the membership of Cuyapacoco were women. And nobody had ever been, no, not, not one president of Cuyapacoco had ever been a female before. Uh, but that all changed with our investment in the fair trade premium and the producer support and development fund into gender inequality work within the cooperative. Lots of adult literacy classes in village societies, lots of work and training on democracy, working with the co-op college. And by 2006, 50% of the national executive were actually women within the cooperative. And by 2010, it had a female president. In 2014, that was also repeated. So in positions of power within the cooperative, helping to make decisions that were important for the, for the future of the relationship with Divine, but also the future of uh, Cuyapacoco. The social premium was mainly used for building schools, building health centers, but also building clean water, uh, boreholes uh, for villagers. Now remember, not everybody in the village is a cocoa farmer. About 25% of people in, in village societies in northern Ghana, mid-Ghana, are cocoa farmers, but everybody gets access to the clean water. That's very, very important. Often, people in the villages, before they got a clean water borehole, were having to walk three or four miles in the dry season to get clean water. And that was often contaminated. So these water wells made a big difference at uh, village level. And, in 2007, when Divide made its first substantial profit, it was able to provide a check to the cooperative and Sandy, the guy with the glasses, was the chair at the time. He, he, worked, he now, his, his, his business is um, Double Exposure Documentaries. They do a lot of documentaries, documentary work for the Discovery Channel. Um, and um, this was a quite significant moment in the cocoa industry. Farmers actually getting a dividend for the shareholding in, uh, in a company. So just to summarize, the importance of r the rise of ethical consumers, the importance of good new product development, you know, across all the different segments of the chocolate market, the importance of collaboration and partnerships, importance of international expansion, Divine in the US has its own office in Washington DC and has a listing in Whole Foods, which is a big supermarket that's got a, its own kind of ethical differentiation within the, within the US market. Its investment comes from the original investors, but increasingly has come from ethical banks like Oiko Credit in the Netherlands. And I can't stress enough the importance of product quality. Very, very important. And the importance of effective market research you know, whether it was dark chocolate, whether it was the name, whether it was changing the brand and evolving the brand, so important for a new business startup. And just want to say thank you. Hopefully I've illuminated the story of Divine Chocolate. And um, that was my experience uh, from 1998 to 2003. I think it was December the 3rd, 2003, when I moved into academia 20 years ago, nearly. Thank you very much, Claire.
Bob, thank you so much. That was, in my opinion, I mean, absolutely inspirational as a story. I'm going to stand over here so I'm not okay. right, <laughs> right next to you. We can tag team a little bit. I thought that was a remarkable story. Um, so relevant to my business planners, um, but also just such a fascinating story. So thank you so thank much you, thank for you, um, sharing all those amazing experiences. We've got lots of questions, so I'm speaking okay. to let you take a, a drink of water sure, <laughs> before, I'm fine. before yeah, yeah. we start inundating you with questions. For those of you who couldn't catch the QR code at the beginning, the QR code is there. Um, if you do want to ask questions, I've got the Padlet in front of me so I can see the, the questions starting to fire up in front of me. Um, I guess the first one that I'll start in, is, I suppose just as, as an end to the story, I suppose do you still play an active role in the business and, and what, what happened in terms of obviously now you're in academia, what did that transition look like and what's happened to, to Divine Chocolate? Yeah. I, I think it's a lesson for all uh, undergraduates is always, always maintain a good relationship with your uh, employers, your previous employers and I've always had that with Divine, particularly when Sophie was there, she was the managing director uh, she left a couple of years ago and I still maintain, I don't have the same strong relationship but I'm sure they'll be watching and listening and interested in what I say today. Um, I still do research on the kind of social enterprise pioneers, people like Cafe Direct, Divine Chocolate, Liberation Notes and I also had a knowledge transfer partnership at one time as well with Divine where we had a graduate who'd, who'd gone to work for them for two years on a new product development process. He was employed by them. He, came, he actually became their new product development manager eventually, and now he's the new head of new product development at Goo, you know, the chocolate pudding company. So he's done very, very well. And um, so, yeah, that's all, it's important to maintain an uh, ongoing relationship, I think. That's great. Yeah. Well, thank you. It also gets chocolate, free chocolate samples as well on a regular basis. So that's and I noticed one of the questions did come up saying can we have some chocolate and I'll say to my business planners there will be a quiz next week that will involve divine chocolate prizes so um, if you make sure you read up on the video lecture content so that you're aware of all the facts that you may need to answer in the quiz then we'll be ready with uh, chocolate prizes so um, uh, do take a look at those. I, I guess you, you, talked, um, you talked a lot about how you had to really build a convincing case for investment sure. in the business and really persuade using all the entrepreneurial skills that you have to persuade the business, uh, to persuade um, investors, the banks to come and invest in you. Yeah. What tips do you have around that pitching? Yeah, but, but great question. Whoever, whoever asked the question, that's a great question because I remember going to ASDA head office in Leeds to do a pitch to the buyer there. And he, he hadn't even booked a meeting room, he just took me into the cafe and his body language is all very defensive. And he took me into the cafe and said, you've got five minutes, all I want to know is your price, your margin uh, and, and, and when, when can you deliver. That's all he said. 45 minutes later, he was, he, he, he was transfixed by my presentation. And what I had was a presentation of Cocoa Farmers. And the presentation, those, some of those pictures I shared with you in the presentation, pictures of Coco, pictures of the farmers, pictures of the impact. And he said, do you know what, Bob? No ever, not, not one chocolate representative from the major multinationals has ever shown me a picture of Coco before or a Coco farmer. Can you imagine that? All, they're in, all, all, all they had in their presentation was a picture of the product, the promotions, you know, the pricing. But what we used was our differentiation our relationship with the farmers, our partnership with the farmers to illuminate the story. And do you know what? He really got it. And this was December the 12th, I remember it. Um, December the 12th, year 2000. And he said to me, can you deliver on Boxing Day? I want to take it into all my stores. And I was thinking, oh my God, they've got 365 stores and he wants uh, divine chocolate in by Boxing Day. <laughs> So we, we, did, we, we did our best, you know, we did our best, and Sam's laughing because he, he, he knows the trials and tribulations of that. But that was the reality of it, and, and I completely persuaded him. And, and, I, and this is, I had like an A3 presentation on an art folder that flipped over the pictures of the, the PowerPoint slides, because in those days, people didn't even have laptop computers in their pictures. They had, you know, A3 art folder presentations. Can you imagine? You know, and, 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 it got, and it got the business. 
So yeah. much of what you're describing is about creativity in the face of some kind of sure. obstacle or opportunity. And I think we talk about that a lot in our module, about how to create space for that creativity and to just respond to challenges, but in the most innovative way that you possibly can. And you've talked a lot about collaboration. And that's something that's very close to our heart on our module is around teamwork, which isn't easy. So I guess, you know, what are your tips for collaboration? How, you know, it's not always smooth, is it? How do you overcome the obstacles that you face in collaboration? Yeah, I think going back to the creativity, creativity is so important when you're setting up a new startup. Uh, I agree with that. In terms of collaboration, for, for a new social enterprise startup, it's so important because you don't necessarily have the economic tangible resources that your competitors have. You don't have the labor, you know, you don't have the, the economies of scale. Um, so what, what can you do that's different that, that captures those resources for yourself as an organization? And the only way you can do that is by collaborating. And obviously, our sh even, down to, even down to our shareholding, it was important. And they all collaborated with us. The body shop never ever had stopped a chocolate product before. But when we launched Divine, they had Divine on the counter right next to the till. And for three months, they sold a lots of chocolate. And Christian Aid, they mobilized all their supporters in that campaign with Tesco's to persuade Tesco's it was a good idea. And Comic Relief provided all the celebrities. We did a Red Nose Day chocolate product with them. We got divided into all news agent sector. The co-op, they wanted to collaborate with us because Cuiapa Coco was a cooperative. So they wanted to work with like-minded organizational types. But to do that, you have to, be, you have to spot the opportunity. You have to, I, my argument is when you're working for these kind of brands, you have to be a better salesperson than your private sector counterparts. You've got to be a better salesperson because you've got to be more creative. And, 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 and I had very good corporate training, uh, but I used that corporate training for the good of a social enterprise startup. That's really interesting, thanks Bob. And the other thing that you talked about, you talked about it right at the beginning around problem solving, and it's really clear from your presentation that your product was grounded in you know, being aligned with the SDGs, as they are yeah, now, sure. but grounded in trying to solve a problem for the supplier of cocoa beans, but also hopefully for the consumer to try and change consumer behavior towards more ethical behavior. But I think what came across, and we've talked about this in our seminars a lot, is that it's not good enough just to have a sustainable or an ethical problem, a, a, a product. Products, that yeah. in itself isn't going to change consumer sure. behavior. It's got to be about the quality of the product, amazing tasting chocolate, or something around the price point as well. And I guess, how did you triangulate that big delivering on the ethical value proposition, actually making that happen for real? Sure. but also competing on price in a really difficult market and yeah. ensuring really high quality. How can you do all of those things? It's a, it's a, it's a really good question. I mean, these are, it's a balancing act, I think, often. Um, I mean, at the time, the only other very high quality chocolate product that was in the market was Green and Blacks. And they were, they were subs subsequently bought by Cadbury's back in 2000 and just trying to think of the year now, 2003, I think they were bought by Cadbury's. Um, but you could, the, the market was starting to stretch, a bit like ice cream. You know, when they, when, if you look at the ice cream market back in 1998, it was all big, large tubs of vanilla ice cream. haagen uh, what's the other brand? haagen Ben & Jerry's, didn't even exist in the UK. But it completely, it, 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 it increased the market by five times, those two products coming into the market, because it made it premium. It stretched the market, and therefore we were able at the time, we were part of that premiumization of chocolate. So our, our pri retail price point at the time was like 1.19, our recommended retail price, and the price of cabbage dairy milk was 70 pence. But we still com we, people still went out and bought it, because it was a better chocolate. There was more cocoa in it, it tasted better. People bought into the ethics of the brand. Um, and uh, I remember Asda, Asda doing this, so they're not listening online. So they took it in that story about Asda. And I, went in, I walked into Asda in January to, uh, 2001. And it says, it had on the price 1.49, which wasn't the recommended retail price. A month later, it's, it said, roll back promotion 1.19. 
on the shelf. <laughs> so it's quite interesting how you deal with those different ethics. And uh, we did walk away for some deals. So, for example, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, a business that, that doesn't exist anymore, Woolworths. So we, Woolworths agreed to stock our Red Nose Day product called Double that we developed with, with, uh, with uh, Comet Relief. And they said, yeah, we'll take it in, 665 stores. And then a week later they said, we'll still take it in, but we want a down payment of 25,000 uh, pounds. And that was a charity product. Yeah, and we just walked away from the deal. So sometimes you've got to say no. Um, sometimes you've got, you can't, don't jeopardize your margin for the kind of quick win. So it's making those judgments as a, as a board, we made that judgment. We decided to walk away from the deal. Really, yeah, difficult yeah. decisions to make. That's really interesting. Because I, 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 the other question that's coming up quite a bit is this idea of your sort of personal values and how, I, I guess what's clear is the business model of a social enterprise gave you the ability to, in some ways to be more creative than the competitors sure. and therefore completely disrupt the entire chocolate market. In the yeah, UK. yeah. Um, but then you, you weren't a charity. No, no, definitely you, you, not. It was this specific decision around a social enterprise, so therefore you had yourself to pay, you know, you're, sure, you had all sure. the directors to pay. How did you kind of balance those needs of meeting the social, the, the values of the social enterprise, but also needing to generate a profit as a, as a social enterprise, yeah. and deciding how much to pay directors, sure. and you know, all those quite pragmatic decisions? Yeah, I mean, some, some, uh, we, had just, we, we had very interesting board meetings. Um, and I, the, the other thing I didn't say at the start was that uh, Quiapa Coco, the cooperative in Ghana, had two representatives on the board. So we used to have four board meetings a year, one in Ghana and three in London. And um, so you always got the farmer's perspective and the farmers always got the, the market perspective. And that helped resolve some kind of challenging decisions. Um, and we did walk away from some, some deals, for example. And we, um, you know, there were some interesting discussions where we didn't agree on everything. You know, we didn't actually agree on everything. So we, 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 we do, I, mean, I, think the, I think the social enterprise element allowed us to differentiate ourselves in what was a very, very kind of uh, mature market that didn't have a lot of innovation in that market. So we were quite innovative. We did do too much though. And this is, an, this is a, a lesson for those people who set up a startup. The, the temptation is to do too much. We were always at festivals during the weekend. We are working seven days a week. And that's not good. You know, you can't sustain that forever. When we got a consultant to come along, I don't even know KPMG. If you work for KPMG, you're allowed six days a year, bona fide, uh, to go and work with a charity. So we had a, a really interesting guy, still a friend of mine, actually, who was the son of a vicar. And he came along and he spent a week with us and he said, Bob, you're trying to do too much. He says, just focus on some strategic partnerships. He said, go and see the co-op and say to them, we'd like to do your private label business. And that's what we did. And straight away, within, within a few months, we had a three million pound contract. So that enables not to, enabled us not to do all these things we were trying to do, sell a, you know, back, a, a van full of chocolate at a festival. So we were able to focus down on some strategic partnerships and, and, and that was great advice. That's a really good example. Thanks, yeah. Bob. I'm going to give one more question and I'm conscious we've had so many questions on the Padlet which is brilliant to see them all coming through and we're not going to get a chance to ask them all. So I will ask one more and apologies to anybody who doesn't get their question asked. It's around, we talk about greenwashing quite a bit on the module. We've got to really deliver what we say we're going to, and it's got to be for real, with heart and soul, not just pretending or sort of for marketing. And I suppose this question is, do you think non-certified sustainable programmes, particularly in the chocolate industry, so Nestle and, and, and yeah. so on, um, you know, are they, are they genuinely doing good, in your opinion? You could spend the whole lecture probably yeah, I mean, I, that. But. I mean, I've just spent six years on the Fair Trade Foundation board as a trustee. Um, so I know, I know a lot about Coco Life. I know a lot about um, Sustainable uh, Promise, Cargill Sustainable, Coco Promise. They're, 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 it's an improvement. It's a better... It's obviously, it's, in a way, it's marking your own, your own homework. But still, it's an improvement. You know, it's an improvement on what was going on before. You know, it's still voluntary. 
It's not mandatory, and there is now new mandatory legislation that's starting to take place in COCO around human rights due diligence at European level. There's new European legislation that will be launched next year in COCO around HRDD. Uh, but obviously the UK is not part of Europe, uh, which is the problem, uh, which it was. Uh, but uh, maybe one day again in the future it will be. Uh, but there are a lot of things. So you can see the cocoa market actually going from voluntary towards man mandatory. Uh, and I think it's good that you know we, sh we shine a light on corporate practice and they are stepping up and improving. So I think that's a good thing. Bob, I could listen to you talk all day because yeah. it's been absolutely fascinating. I know you have to run and I know and students will need to run on to the next thing as well. But Bob, it's been fascinating, so useful for our business planners and I hope it's been of interest to everybody else as well. Thank you very much for joining us and most importantly, Bob, thank you so much. Thank you, Claire. Thank you. Thanks for listening. <laughs>